Привет, Свисин. Гринек Сдитсия. It's time for me to cover another disappointing title released in our current generation. Or, so I should say. Since the internet keeps telling me gaming is dead, well, I've always been an optimist. And this Baldur's Gate 3 game is something I've had my eyes on for a while. Baldur's Gate 3, a sequel to Baldur's Gate 2. I know, it took me a while to figure that one out too. This genre of video games has never been my cup of tea. It seems anytime I try to give these cult classics a go, it ends up being some of the most monotonous couple of hours I ever sink into a game. The worst way to waste my time. Second only to Kenshi. I always feel like a bitter old man when it comes to these types of games. I feel like that old Dosa Quest meme. I don't always play CRPGs, but when I do, I don't have fun. But I gotta say, when loading up Baldur's Gate 1 for the first time and giving it a go, I was pleasantly surprised. Sure, the combat was dated, the UI was a little jank, and the game isn't the prettiest to look at, but for its time, this shit was revolutionary. And today, I still have tons of fun playing this game. Many other titles would come along and try to mimic what Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 did, but they never really got close to the same magic the originals had. And on top of that, it was co-op, up to six players. That's the kind of fun you rarely get with most single-player video games. So naturally, I was excited to see where Baldur's Gate 3 would go, especially when I found out that it was being developed by Larian Studios, which is a company that has quickly become a fan favorite among RPG nerds, simply for their transparency and their unfortunate tendencies to accidentally drop masterpieces. It's been a long development, and it's finally here. Before we get into Baldur's Gate 3, though, let's talk about their previous title first. Divinity 2 Original Sin. This was a game I always wanted to review, but never got around to it. So let me sum up my thoughts in just a couple minutes. Divinity 2 is fucking amazing. This game looks beautiful, has an amazing soundtrack, perfect voice acting, even if there's uh, too much of it sometimes. Hell's worse over here than a dozen rotten eggs dropped in a vat of vinegar. And the gameplay is absolutely flawless. It has some of the best combat I have seen in gaming, hands down and it's churn-based. The biggest rule when making a churn-based combat system is that it cannot be fun. Yet here we have Larian Studios breaking the rules and making a churn-based experience that doesn't make me want to blow my fucking scalp all over my ceiling fan. Thank you, Larian. The best thing about the combat is how unbalanced it is. You can break the game in half if you know what you're doing. And the developers know this. They understand that balancing doesn't make a fun game. Doing cool, crazy shit like this makes a fun game. Now that, shit, now that's badass. The game gives you some general rules and that's it. You're free to think outside the box and pull off some of the nastiest combos these DND nerds have ever seen. One of the most popular exploits is getting an unbreakable chest, filling it with every heavy item you can find, and then using telekinesis to drop it on your enemies' heads, dealing so much damage the number log falls out the side of your monitor trying to calculate what the fuck you just did. Any last words? Be strong, Ben Mezd. The halls await you. Alexander is dead. My contract is fulfilled. This is what makes Divinity 2 so much fun. It completely distracted you from its other flaws like its story, which is easily the weakest aspect of the game by far. It had a nice theme of a traveling group of weirdos trying to save the very world that rejects them, but outside of companion storylines, the main plot is a snooze fest, and the endings for Divinity 2 were less than stellar, to say the least. I guess it's more about the journey rather than the finish line, which is fine, but if half of your player base drops the game by the time they get to Act 3, then there's an issue. This is an RPG that puts a focus on branching paths within its narrative, but why would any of that matter if the core story itself isn't interesting? That's why I cleared out every town for the loot before I went on to the next act, because I just didn't care enough about the world. Basically, Divinity 2 is a masterpiece but it has problems. Because of that, I was curious to see whether or not Baldur's Gate 3 would suffer from the same problems or fix the complaints I had with their previous game. So how did they do? Well, let's start out with the basics first. Character creator. Today, I'm gonna be looking at Baldur's Gate 3, an amazing video game that just came out that has tons of customizable options for your character, and uh, oh my god- Listen, I don't mean to glaze, hyper dick ride even, but the character creator is amazing. I've seen some people make some beautiful monsters with this baby. First time playing, I easily put well over an hour into the creator alone. It's absolutely disgusting how much details in the classes. Even your races matter, both in gameplay and how certain characters react to you. As for the classes, don't be afraid to experiment. You can respec later for only 200 gold, which is nothing. If you're wondering what the meta is right now though, people usually go barbarian with the berserker subclass 
class. It does stupid damage and is perfect for taking out tanky enemies. It's the perfect class to go if you have no idea what the fuck you're doing. Fighter is amazing too. Really all the classes are amazing. There's not a single bad one on this list. You can even make bard work. It's a great support class. It all comes down to your playstyle. Do you want to power through everything and steamroll the average enemy with brute force? Or do you want to use the environment to your advantage, taking high ground and decimating groups with powerful magic while other teammates play support and pick them off from afar? Divinity 2 had lots of freedom with its gameplay, but Baldur's Gate 3 somehow tops it 10 times over. One of the biggest changes I immediately noticed was that there was a bigger focus on physics. Enemies can now get pushed, knocked back, and flung off balconies. Fall damage is a big deal now, so you have to be extra careful about where you're standing or else you and half of your team can get blown into the abyss. It definitely makes exploration feel much more free and rewarding. There will be some scenarios where you can only get up to a place of interest if you have a certain spell or skill on you. You want to take a shortcut? Sure, just drop down here and waste half of your health. Or you can just cast Featherfall and negate the damage altogether. You see a chest all the way up somewhere you can't reach? No excuses. Start climbing. In any other game, there would have been a very elaborate convoluted puzzle to solve this problem, but what's Baldur's Gate's solution? Just fucking fly. This game rewards all playstyles and never feels like you're missing out when using a certain build, which is really hard to pull off, especially when you consider that this game has 12 classes with 46 subclasses. I would have been forgiving otherwise since I understand how hard it is to make all of these playstyles feel entertaining and meaningful, but Larian actually pulled it off. Every class here feels good. Even Druid is awesome. Druid sucks. How the hell did they make Druid good? People who are new to Baldur's Gate might be churned off by the level cap, which is 12. Which, to clarify, is good. I don't want anyone to be churned on to 12. But the leveling is capped that short for good reason. It makes for a more coherent pacing with its gameplay, and makes every level feel like a big deal. Compare one level in Baldur's Gate 3 to 40 levels in Elden Ring. In Elden Ring, 40 levels means you deal more damage and die in 3 hits compared to 2. Now, let's compare that to one level in Baldur's Gate 3. You now have 4 new spells, 3 more subclasses to choose, one of them changing your character's appearance and granting you resistance to a certain element depending on the color you choose for your dragon scales. Oh, and you also now have the ability to use two spells in one turn, yeah, there's no comparison. Baldur's Gate has always had a satisfying leveling system, and it's no different here. Fucking nutty. I would now rather have this type of level system in my games compared to the dog shit we've become so accustomed to seeing in RPGs today. The gameplay is amazing. It's on a completely different level, and the difficulty spikes are nowhere near as bad as it was in their previous titles. It's still pretty bad though. Alright, time for bigger and better things. Let's get the plot out of the way. You start the game and you awaken a chamber. You've been abducted by a group of aliens called Mind Flayers who put a parasite in your brain. And after meeting two females, a first for many players, you crash land and meet up with your fellow captors. And you all conclude that... <laughs> We're all fucked. The parasite is attached to your brain, and you're going to turn into a Squidward. And not handsome Squidward either. It's more like Red Mist Squidward Suicide, the final clarinet interruption. But the transformation hasn't happened yet. So your goal is to figure out a way to get this parasite out of your head, so you can go back to living your normal life, which is shitposting about Faerun politics, and sharing your unfathomable hatred for gnomes on discussion boards about how they all secretly control society. I'll just say now, the plot? is pretty good. The presentation is awesome, and the opening cinematic you get to see is one of the coldest game introductions I have witnessed. However, what really carries the plot is, of course, its characters. I liked Divinity 2's companions, but, I mean, shit, there's no comparison. Lazel, Shadowheart, Astarian, Will, Gale, Jahira, who was in Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, all of them. There's not a single companion that I dislike, and there's a lot of them. I was actually sad that there was a four-party member limit, since I wanted to experience all of the companions at once. Usually there's games like Dragon Age where they always have this one companion that I absolutely hate, but that's not the case here. These are all very competently written characters. With that being said, I do play favorites. Astarian is my favorite twink. Now I'm sure you'll be able to tell this guy's personality just by me mentioning his class, so let's give it a try. You ready? Okay. He's a rogue. This jumped up fruitcake is easily the most charismatic character of the bunch. <laughs> you want more? As you wish, dear one. Oh, bravo! Encore. <laughs> it was a fine strike. Excellent form. <laughs> He's not necessarily a good or bad guy. He's just really really funny, and funny characters tend to be chaotic neutral. He's a little fruity, but he gets the job done. Those critical hits do not lie. Besides, a little bit of homosexual behavior never hurt anyone. I let him kill and help me get paid, and then I let him smash my cakes. 
Shit. He is a character so charming, so likable, so undeniably useful, that it currently has every female and bi-curious e-celeb fanning over him. And for good reason. His voice actor, Neil Newbin, did an outstanding job voicing him. And I am now a fan. A star and story in Boulder's Gate 3 is well written, but Neil is the one that pieces it all together in the end. His performance is enough to make you cry from laughter and cry from devastation. I can't wait to see what this guy does next. Godspeed, Neil. You beautiful bastard. His advertising for the game was no joke either. Just look at this piece of art. That's why I've decided to launch Only Fangs. Your number one source for exclusive, unrated, vampire spawn content. Jesus fucking Christ. I can only imagine how the call went, trying to get him back into the studio to record these lines. Hello, Neil. We need you to come in and record a few more lines. This one is important. Uh, Sven, the fuck is this? The other companions are great too. My usual squad was Astarian for the crits and the humor, Will for the moral guidance, and Lazel for hardcore sex that leaves you inches away from death. That's how I like my women. No intimacy, just pure murderous intent. There are actually some complaints for the companions, with people claiming they were too woke, quote unquote. Personally, I believe that if a game is pissing off either side of the political compass, then that means they're doing something right. I guess people said that the females in this game are too masculine, which honestly can't relate. I actually think they were too feminine in this game. That's why I kicked Shadowheart out of my group, because she kept acting like a, a well, uh, how do I phrase this correctly? Uh, she kept acting like a woman. Compare that to Lazelle. She doesn't get in her feelings, she has a warrior spirit, and she can't get pregnant. What does Shadowheart offer other than being emotionally damaged with a shitty haircut? I rest my case. However, as much as I love this game, I do have some issues. We all know about performance problems, and that's already been tweaked and improved with more patches to come, but my biggest issues lie within the story itself. I don't want to say too much, since that would result in some spoilers, and I think this story is good enough to not warrant any of those, so let's start off with something vague. In the character creator, you get this option at the end to customize a second character, your guardian. Off the rip, I was interested in where this would go, and I was hoping it would be more of an intimate and well-executed concept of Divinity 2's story with how each character had its own god, but instead it resulted in some very strange twists that I honestly still don't know how to feel about. Without giving too much away, the Guardian is your protector, but he or she is not what they make themselves out to be, and they have secrets. Those secrets are revealed later in the game, and honestly, it's not the worst plot twist. It adds a new awkward dynamic to the narrative and makes the situation much more morally gray. The concept of having your own unique guardian that you get to customize yourself and have watch over you throughout your playthrough as you build a closer relationship with them is really cool. But that idea gets thrown out the window right after this plot twist. Shit. Especially when the Guardian starts being so manipulative, it makes everything too one-sided in my opinion. A good quarter of the dialogue was just the Guardian gaslighting you. The biggest complaint I have overall though is, unfortunately, the ending. Not the gameplay or anything. In fact, the ending bit is fantastic until the last five minutes. Picture this, Baldur's Gate 3. It's a game that, up until this point, has taken its sweet time telling an engaging story with exciting combat. It's a game that drip feeds you content and gives you more and more as you go on. Characters slowly develop and conflict unfolds with near perfect pacing. And after 100 hours of playtime, you make it to the final fight. You give one last powerful push and beat the final boss. It's over. Now is the time to take in all that you have done and celebrate with your companions as you relish in your- No, I mean, it's over. Credits. Thanks for playing. What the fuck? Boulder's Gate 3 is a game that puts you through a lot. And I mean a lot. And it does so with a flow that seems to not emit any details. So to see this game almost be in a rush to end everything at the one moment that really matters it kind of takes the wind out of my sails, not gonna lie. The most infuriating part is that there is a ton of cutout end content that would completely fix this problem for me and many other people, but apparently Larian was all like, nah bro, this shit fire. It's a big negative. Because the best part of the game for me, aside from the glorious combat, was the characters. The characters were set up to be the most perfect group of companions in gaming history, but they flunked their storyline's conclusions at the last moment. Everyone just kind of pieces out. You'd think after such a journey, you'd have a hard heartfelt conversation with them about how far you've come, hugging it out, 
kissing it out, fucking it out, I don't know, whatever friends do. But none of that barely happens. The only character that really got a somewhat satisfying end was Lazelle, and uh, once you see her ending, you'll realize that that's not saying much. The ending is underwhelming, but it doesn't ruin the experience for me, and it can be fixed if the developers are willing. The game just did so many things perfectly up until this point that I couldn't possibly stay mad at it. Besides, at least it has the essentials. You want a happy ending? You get a happy ending. Just only five seconds of it. But hey, if you're still angry about that playthrough, at least you can do an evil run right after to vent out all of your frustrations. The Dark Urge storyline. This is an origin story you go if you plan to be a more morally gray or evil character. And it's pretty great, I'm not gonna lie. You'll be overwhelmed with this feeling of bloodlust that can only be sated by murdering the fuck out of people. Your character will get so desperate, in fact, that he will just get out of his bedroll and start murdering his comrades while they sleep. See this girl? Looks nice, right? I saw her in my main playthrough. Did you know she has an alternate outfit? Check this out. Yeah. Yeah, I love this game. Sex scenes are also a thing too, because of course they are. And they are pretty graphic. Like, CD Projekt Red graphic. Like, the only thing missing is stretched out JPEGs of semen. I was pretty monogamous in my first playthrough, but as soon as I hit my second, this dick was rated E for everyone. Tieflings, elves, drow, twinks, bears, yes, motherfucker, even bears, uh, although I wasn't the one doing the fucking. A lot of people actually got grossed out and offended by this scene. I suppose now was a good time to find out that over-the-top fiction is taboo. My simple response to such outrage is, listen, if a bear was going to fuck you, He'd do it. You don't just say no to a bear. Does this look like something that respects a social construct such as consent? I guarantee you, if it was a wolf, none of you white girls would say anything. With that being said, Larian Studios, you're all a bunch of sick fucks. Overall, I loved every second of this game. It's pretty much everything I wanted after Divinity 2, and I am satisfied more than satisfied. I hope they continue to patch the game and add content that fixes some of the issues people have with this title, but when it comes down to whether or not Larian succeeded in making a great sequel to a long-standing franchise, the answer is an overwhelming yes. They knocked it out the fucking park. This year for gaming has been slapping, and Baldur's Gate 3 is the shining example. And to think this game almost got picked up by Obsidian Entertainment, that would have been a fucking disaster. The game would have been somehow even more buggier with an insultingly bad combat system. Most likely would have been yet another disappointment to add to their catalog. Uh, oh well. At least they made Fallout New Vegas. Baldur's Gate 3 is a game that improves on every element from its previous releases. The combat, the graphics, the voice acting, the music, the pacing, the story, everything is a dramatic improvement and I'm happy with what they've managed to pull off here. The game is extremely faithful to classic Baldur's Gate while still innovating with its own ideas and ditching ones that made the original BG games dated, uh, at least by today's standards. I had a blast playing this game, and I'm going to continue sinking in more hours into this masterpiece. I give this game, in its current state, the strongest 9 out of 10 I can possibly give. Go buy it, go play it, refund it, then repeat the cycle. A welcome face. How can I help? Thanks for watching, everybody. I am gonna go and play some Papa Pizzeria. Tune in next time, where I attempt to beat Millennia with 18 vigor, no summons. Look at that, damn it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. Ha <laughs> ha!